Thank you all for coming. This is our first seminar for this academic year. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Angel. She's currently a lecturer in creative writing at the Kingston, Kingston University. And uh, she has published a lot. I'm just going to mention her book, uh, Author of a Mustard, uh, a book of desire, most difficult to tell. It was published in 2012. She's now working, I think, um, <laughs> on a monograph on uh, psychiatric ontologies, female sexual dysfunction, and the DSM, and I'm really looking forward to, to this publication. Um, and today she's presenting a paper entitled uh, When is the past in female sexual dysfunction? Thank you. Thank you. I should say I'm at the tail end of a pretty disgusting cold, so forgive any coughing or um, <sighs> sort of huskiness or, you know, croakiness. I'll try and keep it at bay. Um, so, as Kira said, I um, <laughs> am ostensibly working on this monograph, which I've been kind of ostensibly working on for a very long time. Um, and I suppose I just want to kind of put this in a little bit of context, which is that, um, so I have been mostly in history and sort of history and philosophy of um, science departments um, over the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, and doing research with some very nice postdocs on female sexual dysfunction and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. But I also have this kind of other writing life in a way which is related but that um, manifests itself in kind of writing that I guess I would describe as literary non-fiction and that's published um, sort of outside, you know, outside of academia. It's um, I don't know what the word is, general audience, kind of publishing, whatever. Um, and I suppose the big <laughs> question for me is how to write about this material that my academic research um, is involved in. And in a way this paper is me grappling with that question of what kind of book I want to write based on this material. Um, because, you know, I've been writing that book for quite a while and it hasn't come out in, in the sort of academic um, form that I had originally intended it to be in. So, um, I have a few images but I'm just going to read and if you can't hear me or anything please shout or wave. I've been trying to write a book, an academic book, about female sexual dysfunction for years. It's been driving me crazy. It's now become this kind of joke, the book I am and I'm not writing. My friend Sarah says to me, how's the book going? You know, the boring one with footnotes. Every time I laugh and every time I feel stung. Why is writing it such an agony? Academic writing, Maggie Nelson has said, too often relies on a logic of paranoia, pointing out the blind spots in someone else's thinking and going in for the kill. More appealing, I think, to tip an object towards the light, as poet Elizabeth Bishop puts it. And philosopher Cora Diamond, writing about J.M. Katzia's wonderful book, Elizabeth Costello, says that our reliance on argumentation may be a way we make our unavailable to ourselves our own sense of what it is to be a living animal. What do we lose in argument? What do we lose in writing? In fact, my feeling of struggle with this book is I think precisely to do with the nature of the subject itself. There's something about the topic that lends itself to hesitation, fear, silence, paralysis, despite or perhaps because of the excessive verbosity that has met female sexuality. Writing about sexuality, psychiatry, psychoanalysis is an exercise in tiptoeing through a minefield. It's a process of trying delicately to move amongst decades, if not centuries, of anger, offence, outrage and hurt in order to say something, just something, which will in any case most likely cause anger, offence, outrage or hurt. Female sexual dysfunction is a general umbrella term for a range of conditions listed in the American Psychiatric Association's DSM. <laughs> How do I get this to do? So these are the different editions of the DSM, and this picture is often used to sort of illustrate 
how much more medicalized and psychiatrized we have become with the increasing thickness of the manuals as they've come through the years. The DSM is a document that, although it's a professional manual for an American guild, has in the last 35 years gained a remarkable global importance. Changes in US drug regulation, the emergence of a global pharmaceutical industry, and the power of the insurance industry in the US have turned this manual into a kind of connective tissue for biomedical psychiatry. A, di a DSM diagnosis is needed for reimbursement by third party payers in the US, and international research, including drug development, is coordinated through its categories. This makes the DSM a highly controversial bureaucratic tool, and critics accuse it of a kind of imperialism, of flattening out illness language globally, and of encouraging the medicalization of often social phenomena through the worrying power of Big Pharma. The manual was comprehensively reworked in the late 70s, resulting in the DSM-3 of 1980. This process of revision reflected not just an increasing hostility to the psychoanalytic thought that had dominated American psychiatry from the 30s to the 60s, but also an urge to disarm the accusations levelled at psychiatry about its non-scientific nature, its spuriousness, and the various abuses committed in its name. So the DSM-3 adopted an apparently more precise classification of many conditions, and in the case of sexual problems, the classification was highly influenced by the terminology of sexologists William Masters and Virginia Johnson. So that, there is the human sexual response cycle uh, of Masters and Johnson, which, as you'll see, includes excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. And while the DSM-3 was heavily influenced by them, it also changed, um, to some extent, this, uh, this cycle by inserting the kind of necessary state of desire as a precursor to then excitement, orgasm, and resolution. So Masters and Johnson hadn't formulated into the um, cycle the pre-existing desire. So the new manual categorised problems into these, into these um, broad groups, desire, arousal, orgasm and pain. And this new DSM was to ally itself insistently and perhaps too insistently with the measurable, the quantifiable and the objective. Just as feminist scholarship was highly critical of frigidity, so too has it been critical of female sexual dysfunction, of FSD. Psychologist Leonor Tifa, prominent in this field, argued in the 1980s and 90s, yes, at the 80s and 90s, that the DSM classification's allegiance to Masters and Johnson resulted in a model of sexuality that was mechanical, linear, and reductive. So this is the New View campaign that um, Tifa spearheaded and kind of around and under which a lot of um, feminist critiques of the DSM have been organised. So Tifa argued that the DSM used a model that relied on a particular population segment, a sexually enthusiastic and successful one, so namely um, a population segment that wanted sex, that uh, was able to have sex and who, that was able to reach orgasm to set the clinical standard for normality. So in other words, anyone differing from those individuals who could have sex, who wanted sex and had sex and could reach orgasm, and also who were happy to be observed in laboratory conditions doing so, was by definition pathologized. But in fact, there wasn't a great deal of interest, either enthusiastic or critical, in the FSD classifications in the DSM until after Viagra's licensing in 1998. Viagra's blockbuster success for erectile dysfunction led to a pharmaceutical rush to test Viagra and similar compounds in women. The hope being that, just as in men, perhaps so too in women, a vasocongestive drug that increased engorgement, blood flow and swelling, the hydraulic kind of swelling metaphors abounded excitably in this period, would yield a blockbuster drug for them too. Though a drug targeting which element of the broad term FSD was never that clear, was it desire that was being targeted? Was it arousal? Was it the holy grail of orgasm itself? As it happened, these drugs failed pretty miserably. And this failure resulted in a reorientation to the brain and to hormones as the site of pharmaceutical excitement, yielding a kind of weary insistence on the complexity of female desire and the female brain, 
since irritatingly an increase in vaginal lubrication, for instance, seemed to have very little impact on women's desire to have sex in the first place. And so a renewed emphasis, historically familiar, on female sexuality as volatile, as capricious, and as enigmatic, was invoked in part in order to explain the dead ends of pharmaceutical research. So the feminist critique of FSD has lobbied the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, hard over the years over many promised drugs, and it's emphasised sexual problems in women as perhaps especially the result of complex political socio-economic phenomena. Education, communication, safety, tiredness due to disparities in work and care, experience of abuse and violence, difficulties to do with self-image, and so on, all phenomena related to women's inferior social and economic status. The campaign has seen pharmaceutical psychiatry as placing women under ever-increased pressure to experience high levels of desire, to become easily aroused, and to perform sexually with ease, when the realities of women's lives structured by inequality might make their sexual difficulties understandable, and in some sense inevitable. So psychiatric formulations, the critique argues, has created norms of sexual performance, which women will inevitably fall short of, creating a market of dissatisfaction perfect for opportunistic pharmaceutical companies. But alongside and sometimes overlapping with this feminist critique of sexual dysfunctions has been work more recently by psychologists and sexologists putting forward alternatives to the sexual response cycle as understood in the DSM-3, the model influenced by Masters and Johnson. These models challenge the distinguishability of desire and arousal in women, and in their emphasis on the precariousness and contingency of desire, they echo the feminist critique. In recent years, a phenomenon that I think of as the naturalization of low desire has been unfolding. And by naturalization of low desire, I mean three related phenomena. First, an insistence that desire for women waxes and wanes over the course of relationships and life. Second, an insistence that low desire need not necessarily be seen as a dysfunction and might be an understandable adaptation to circumstance. And third, the view that desire may be responsive. So rather than a desire being an autonomous and sort of spontaneous sense of lust, desire might be something that emerges from arousal rather than um, preceding arousal. And I'll be touching on the last two a little bit more here. So in the DSM-3, the category of hypoactive sexual desire disorder saw as definitional the experience of a spontaneously arising desire for sex and of fantasies and thoughts about sexual activity. But it's been argued that many women report not having regular sexual fantasies and that many women often experience sexual desire as a state that emerges in response to stimulation. And so the argument goes, HSDD over-pathologized women by assuming that their sexuality functioned on this linear model of desire preceding arousal, etc., etc., associated, whether rightly or wrongly, with the sexuality of men. And the DSM-5, which came out in 2013, quite radically changed um, the classifications of sexual dysfunction on the basis of this research. And the reclassification in the DSM-5 emphasised in particular the responsivity of desire in many women, so shifting the focus away from this linear progression that begins with desire and leads to arousal. So HSD, HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, low desire disorder, was replaced by female sexual interest slash arousal disorder. The DSMs are not the most well-written documents in history. <laughs> And this category was aiming to include a range of behavioural, subjective and physical aspects of desire and arousal. So it was aiming to undo what had been seen as an overly narrow physiological focus in um, accounts of sexual function and dysfunction. And necessary for its diagnosis is the present of three out of six criteria. These criteria are absent or reduced interest in sexual activity, Absent or reduced sexual erot or erotic thoughts or fantasies. Absent or reduced initiation of sexual activity and a lack of responsiveness to a partner's attempts to initiate. Absent or reduced 
excitement or pleasure during sexual activity on almost all, or all sexual encounters, absent or reduced sexual interest in response to any internal or external sexual slash erotic cues, and absent or reduced genital or non-genital sensations during sexual activity on almost all oral sexual encounters. So what's key here is a new inclusion of and emphasis on responsive factors in determining a diagnosis. But also key is the fact that there is now no, categ no category for women in the DSM which includes the term desire. So in the DSM-5, women can no longer have a desire disorder as such. Men can have desire disorders, they can be diagnosed with HSDD, low sexual desire, since perhaps desire is a kind of baseline state that we ascribe to men. And for men, it's a lack of desire that we see as an anomaly, as something already pathological. But in DSM-5, women can have disorders of sexual interest or sexual arousal, but not problems of desire, since I think in some way a lack of desire is becoming definitional for women. The shift to interest as opposed to desire in this classification is instructive, I think. The term interest speaks of notions of incentive and reward of the kind evolutionary psychology has favoured with its highly gendered politics of female sexuality as a goal-focused and service-oriented behaviour. I will be a good waitress, you will give me a tip, I will give you some sex, you will give me a diamond and your loyalty. Rosemary Basson's incentive motivation model of desire, which I think is very tellingly named, um, was one of the models influential in the reworking of DSM-5. She has argued that women most often engage in sexual activity not because of an intrinsic desire, but from a state of sexual neutrality. And she argues that they're primarily motivated by non-sexual reasons, such as desire for emotional closeness, for example. So this more cognitive and rational conception of behavior that um, I think suffuses this category also chimes with a tendency to seek explanations for sexuality in women, a tendency that is not as often found in relation to men. Many media articles and books, such as clinical psychologist Cindy Meston's and evolutionary psychologist David Doss's Why Women Have Sex, preoccupy them themselves with explanations for sex in women. And the answer to the question of why women have sex seems to be, well, all kinds of reasons. To boost self-esteem, to cement relationships, to exact revenge, to make themselves feel good, to experience pleasure, to express love, to maximize partner fidelity, and so on and so on. These kinds of accounts, so inclusive, in fact push the concept of reason to the limits of their intelligibility. The notion of why becomes almost redundant through its ability to be answered by pretty much anything. And we might do better to ask whether the language of reasons is actually the right language to use in the first place. I think the model this language assumes is of sex as a realm where we rationally weigh up considerations. And I think it also reveals an attachment to an idea of women as not characterized by the same strange, complex drive that sexuality is. It sees women as detached from the realm of sex, as stepping in and out of it for various other kinds of reasons, as indulging in a risk-benefit analysis of sex for aims considered usually more noble, such as concerns with child-rearing or intimacy, rather than lust. Now, this language, along with the renewed emphasis on responsiveness rather than spontaneous desire, is, I think, an important part of an attempt to avoid pathologizing what we understand as female sexuality by avoiding assuming a presumed male norm. But in the process, it raises troubling cliches about men as those who want and ask for sex, and women as those who, after weighing up their non-sexual interests, go shoulder-shruggingly along for the ride. In a world where women saying no to sex is routinely met with entitled disbelief and coercive cajoling, to put it mildly, and where women saying yes to sex is so often subjected to shaming and to these kinds of rationalizations in the service of an allegedly higher aim. It's a dangerous path to make an indifferent acquiescence to sex a definitional aspect of female sexuality. And I should say here that the terms in which these debates tend to unfold are kind of overwhelmingly heterosexual. So the model of 
sexual arousal and desire that is being used is from the very outset being understood in terms of heterosexual partnerships. This naturalization of low desire is in fact, I think, at risk of itself becoming something of a new orthodoxy, a way of resigning oneself to a reassuring sense of women as undesiring creatures. And it's certainly become a key part in the fight against the pharmaceutical medicalization of sex. <coughs> so flibanserin, actually it was given a new name recently, Addy, Addy, A-D-D-Y-I, is a drug that was designed on a model um, whereby a lack of spontaneous desire amounts to a dysfunction. So designed on the model of HSDD, of the low desire um, diagnosis in the earlier DSM before DSM-5. Pharmaceutical companies get a lot out of a view of sexual desire as purely spontaneous. If many women don't experience a sudden surging sexual desire, it's a short leap to frame this lack as one to be remedied by a drug, which is precisely what has happened with, this, with um, flibanserin. So the recent successful attempts by Sprout Pharmaceuticals, Sprout Pharmaceuticals, <laughs> I feel it lacks a certain gravitas, <laughs> to see flibanserin through the FDA licensing system, relied significantly on invoking a feminist rhetoric about sexism as the reason why the FDA has licensed so many more treatments for men's sexual problems than for women's. A disingenuous rhetoric of injustice then underpinned the fight to help women with their woefully neglected sexual problems through the promise of a drug to be taken daily and long term, reckoned overwhelmingly to have been poorly tested and to have equivocal benefits as well as potentially dangerous side effects and it was licensed despite clear evidence against both its safety and its efficacy. But now a model of female desire as responsive rather than spontaneous has become a key part of the battle against this kind of reckless licensing. It's a crucial component now in the strategy to prevent this kind of irresponsible pharmaceutical development. So a view of women's sexuality as complex, as responsive rather than active, and as kind of skittish and unreliable is invoked by the feminist activists um, fighting the FDA as a reason why drugs are not the solution. But I think it's worth questioning the attachment to this new emphasis. Are we replacing one problematic model of, fem of female desire with another? In fact, in emphasizing desire as an emotional and unreliable and kind of elusive phenomenon in women, the DSM-5 has undone the exhortation to a smooth and hyperfunctional sexuality that was precisely the target of criticism in the manual's earlier incarnations. And this new emphasis on this kind of unreliable desire also speaks, I think, to a prevalent anxiety about contemporary sexual culture. So recent years have seen a saturation of concern not only about a psychiatry that urges individuals to see themselves as dysfunctional in the service of pharmaceutical consumption, but also about a culture urging individuals to see themselves as appetitive machines to, whose desires operate in the service of a pornographic consumption. So alongside the numerous books that we have on the ills of DSM, the DSM and pharmaceutical psychiatry, so where that psychiatry is seen as convincing us, for example, that we're depressed when actually we're grieving or as having ADHD when we're overstimulated by technology. Alongside those kinds of books, we have numerous works on the ills of pornography and what is called sexualization of culture. So parliamentary reports, um, anti and pro-pornography debates, and books with titles such as Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our, Sexual, Our Sexuality. These books circulate and these themes circulate with almost as much frantic insistence as the pornography they describe. The urge to underscore the obstacles to desire in women can be seen as performing a very useful and reassuring function in this kind of cultural context. It can be seen as a counter to what is perceived as an increasing pressure on young women to be kind of hypersexual. It can be seen as a resistance to a naive post-feminist celebration of sex, itself understood as pervasive throughout media. It can be understood as a resistance to the growing acceptance of pornography, 
and as a way of insisting on acknowledging the cultural and social forces that render women obediently and performatively sexual. These are the concerns that I think are significant in the atmosphere behind the shifts in the DSM. So where the DSM-3 of 19, 1980, where its classifications of dysfunctions emerged from a desire within American psychiatry to make itself immune to critique, a desire to look scientific at the very least and to lay the ghosts of anti-psychiatry to rest after the turmoil of the Freud Wars, and these um, DSM-3 classifications through the work of Masters and Johnson also sought to put female sexual needs on the same footing as men by underscoring a shared biological drive for sex in men and women. But the current sexual dysfunction classifications come out of a very different set of phenomena, significantly unaware of the phenomenal pressures exerted by the global pharmaceutical industry, and as well as this heightened concern with the sexualization of culture. Many protagonists in the contemporary debate about FSD, both within psychiatry and outside it, are animated by a concern that psychiatry and the pharmaceutical companies have been in a kind of conceptual cahoots with a so-called sexualized culture. So I think protagonists in this debate are kind of exercised by the idea that psychiatry, in promoting a picture of sexuality as linear and reliable, and in seeing a lack of desire as pathological, had been in some way doing the dirty work of pornography and post-feminism. And so against the background of that anxiety, representing female desire as inherently fractious and as reticent, as nowhere near as reliable as a society apparently drowning in pornography would like, forms part of an urge to slow what is seen as a rampant sexual culture down. The feminism that suffuses the debates about FSD is one that is deeply shaped by the Freud wars. In one sense, the feminist critique of the DSM has triumphed. It's got a concession in the DSM-5 that desire for women is complex and emotional and circular, that sexuality is not linear and mechanical. But the move I've been talking about to naturalize low desire in women needs to be seen, I think, as emerging from a particular moment in both the history of psychiatry and in the history of feminism. This is because it's a move that satisfies both a psychiatry that is inordinately keen to distance the kind of threatening figure of Freud and a feminism anxious about what it means to interpret a patient's symptom. Discussions of female sexuality inevitably find themselves confronting the problematic legacy of psychoanalysis, or rather the legacy of Freud, or rather more precisely of Freud in, as a sort of figure in, question, in quotation marks. So Juliet Mitchell, writing in 1984, um, said that the greater part of the feminist movement has identified Freud as the enemy. In America, she claims, with varying degrees of subtlety, he's portrayed as one of the greatest misogynists of all time. In The Feminine Mystique of 1963, Betty Friedan casting her merciless eye around the suburbs of America, dissected the private misery fostered by what she called the sexual solipsism of Sigmund Freud. Kate Millett saw Freud as beyond question the strongest individual counter-revolutionary force in the ideology of sexual politics. And Anne Kurt wrote about the myth of the vaginal orgas orgasm, Freud's allegedly most pernicious legacy. Freud's re readily identifiable enemy makes its way into um, pretty much everywhere, including this image that I'm fond of from Screw magazine in 1970, which I don't know if you can see it that clearly. Um, Freud on a toilet, shithead of the week, <laughs> noted misogynist. Um, and I suppose these, you know, these are images and quotes from the 60s and 70s, but I think they're very significant in the kind of background of the debate that is still unfolding now. So much critique of psychoanalytic psychiatry in a wide range of fields, from the history of psychiatry to queer theory, has reflected a desire to undo and move beyond psychoanalysis' troubled past, its phallocentric epistemology, its authoritarian herding of individuals into pathologizing categories that are used to justify coercive forms of treatment for aberrations, aberrations such as homosexuality, feminism, or the pre a predilection for the wrong kind of orgasm, 
And Freud, or rather a kind of hypostasized symbolic figure of Freud, operates in psychiatric discourse as the often inarticulated foil for a modern, rational and neutral psychiatry. So it's against Freud that biological psychiatry reinvigorated itself in the 70s, leading to DSM-3, and it's against Freud that much of the Anglo-American feminism that suffuses the contemporary debate pitted itself against. The recognition that in the name of the unconscious, various motives can be attributed to patients by therapists with impunity and without any means of critical rejection was an important part of the movement against psychoanalysis. Experts could read into women's physical and mental symptoms the transgression of various norms, such as docility, heterosexuality, femininity, that could then be reasserted. But out of a reaction against the sometimes harmful effects of an insistence that symptoms can express desires of which a sufferer is not aware, this possibility, namely the possibility that a patient does not know himself or herself, has become the bête noire that is engaged with, with difficulty in the debate about female sexual dysfunction. Interpreting sexual symptoms raises the spectre, I think, of Dora and of other patients disbelieved by Freud and Breuer and of uh, countless analysts since, the spectre of analysts discounting the story that a patient tells about her experience and supplementing that story with another more repressive one. As many protagonists in the current field have emphasised, the problem of low desire in women might not need to be described as a problem, and certainly not as a medical one, since it is often an understandable outcome of stressful life conditions. And so many urge a kind of semantic redescription of sexual dysfunctions. In their recent book, Frigidity, an Intellectual History, historians Peter Kreil and Alison Moore write that anticipating ethical questions uh, anticipating ethical objections to our work has been a difficult matter. They say that in Anglophone queer studies and feminist circles, it may go without saying that a frigid woman is merely a construct within the wider network of a normative imaginary. They go on to say, surely a woman who cannot experience orgasm from penis vagina penetration simply needs something else or something additional. Surely if nothing causes her to climax, then her pleasure simply needs to be understood on its own terms. Surely if a woman feels no desire for sex of any kind, she should merely do as she pleases. And they're saying that in a slightly, um, slightly kind of parodic way, that they're slightly parroting a position in their introduction to their book, so it's, I'm not straightforwardly attributing that um, as a position of theirs. A corollary of their questions within much of the current debate might be, if women aren't distressed by wanting sex, who are we to bother them? In the case of FSD and of the question of low desire, one feminist tactic has been to argue against the medicalization of, of low desire by simply asking why it's thought of as low. So in an article in the New Statesman recently, a journalist writes that, I struggle to understand why not wanting sex should even be considered a problem. Sex is one of many things to taste and enjoy. If we really want to even the score, and that was the name of the campaign um, for uh, the licensing of flibanserin through the FDA, invoking this uh, sense of inequality and sexism. If we really want to in even the score, we should respect each woman's true desires instead of handing over their dysfunction to the forces of the market. But what are any particular woman's true desires? What are anyone's true desires? Pharmaceutical companies are undeniably reifying ideas of what counts as normal sex drive for commercial benefit. But the idea that not wanting sex can't at least sometimes, in some cases, be allowed to be considered as a problem is equally troubling. There are many different kinds of not wanting, just as there are many different kinds of wanting. It's possible to want to want, to want something you used to feel but miss and whose absence is painful. It's also possible to not want to want, to be afraid of wanting sex, to be anxious about it, to be vulnerable about it, especially given the remarkably robust double standard. So the answer to the question of who are we to bother them should not, I think, be straightforward. And the question, I suppose, for me, is how we might speak with empathy and curiosity about people's sexual suffering, given a very well-founded skepticism about what diagnostic categories do. So what do we say about somebody who doesn't want sex, but wants to want sex, 
and somebody who experiences that as a loss. What do we say about someone who experiences pain during sex and wants to not experience pain? In fact, the question of sexual pain, so the class, there's various classifications that are often changing um, related to pain during um, attempts at penetrative sex. This question is very suggestive. Pain is not amenable to the usual critiques of um, sexual classifications in psychiatry because it's harder to argue that pain is a symptom that can disappear through redescription. So we can redescribe a situation in which a woman fails to reach vaginal orgasm as not being a dysfunctional situation by arguing, for instance, that vaginal orgasm is rare or is possibly a red herring in the first place. We can argue that failure to reach any kind of orgasm is only a dysfunction if we rule that reaching orgasm is the only legitimate goal of sexual activity. So these are ways that um, sexual dysfunctions are kind of re-described as not necessarily being dysfunctions. But in the face of someone's experience of pain, pain during an activity that that person might want to be able to pursue because it would otherwise give her pleasure, it's harder simply to say, well, don't have sex if it causes pain. There exist treatments for sexual pain conditions and they consist in a range of cognitive, behavioral and relaxation techniques designed to help the patient to be able to achieve penetrative sex. And one can argue, I think quite convincingly, that these treatments in helping women to overcome pain that they experience during sex are a disturbing underlining or an inculcation of a norm that women must have penetrative sex. So in treating women's sexual difficulties, Thea Caccioni and, um, I've forgotten her first name, somebody, Carol Borkovitz, when discussing therapies for sexual pain conditions, note that there are clearly important ways in which the sexual therapies discussed here reproduce normative heterosexuality. But this formulation, as convincing as it is, also opens up a troubling impasse for the question of how to address the suffering of individuals whose desire and pleasure happen to involve heterosexual penetration. So Anne-Marie de Gose, I'm never sure how to pronounce her surname, has described in her recent book, Orgasmology, a tendency within certain strands of queer theory to cast orgasm as a convenient figure for quiescent normativity. Notwithstanding, she says, the tendency for orgasm to be conscripted by contemporary theory to any number of utopian projects, she cautions against a, con a consequent dismissal of orgasm. And I think the same might be said for penetration in the context of these um, debates about sexual pain. The point is precisely that we, not women, but all of us, do not always know what our true desires are or why our bodies do what they do. And in these cases, it's not clear to me that an appropriate supportive and feminist response to sexual distress is to take a first order lack of desire or an experience of pain at face value and shrug one's shoulders comfortable in the assertion that it's merely a pharmaceutical cynicism and a sexualized culture and a medicalizing um, classification system that is making women feel for instance that they should want sex. We don't really know ourselves, we're not always the best judge of our sufferings our symptoms can take surprising forms and we may be invested in not listening to them. It is of course an impossible and a delicate thing to create a vocabulary around sexuality that allows for two things at once, that allows for the excavation of complex processes that have caused painful phenomena, but that does not exist on a rule bound, does not insist on a rule bound and inflexible approach to suffering. I think that we are all in search, in lifelong search in fact, of ways of being in the particular bodies that we happen to have, ways of being that can feel fruitful, exhilarating and peaceful. I don't feel satisfied with a, a critique of psychiatry that relies upon denying our unknowability to ourselves or on denying the difficulty of ever figuring out what it is that we really want. I don't think that we simply know or work out what we want and then act on that knowledge. I feel that working out what we want is a life's work and it has to be done over and over and over. Leonor Tifa, the prime mover behind the sort of critical scholarship and feminist activism on F FSD, associated with the New View campaign that I mentioned earlier, is unhappy with the language of interiority, of depth, 
and of uncovering causes that's associated with psychoanalysis. This sort of archaeological language and this way of thinking about ourselves and about identity itself, the idea of an occult interior life with, with sorry, an in, occult interior life which we can uncover with various technologies, whether those are electrophysiology or hypnosis or free association, is, as historians and also as Foucault have reminded us, a very specific historical contingency whose inevitability and intuitiveness we do well to unpick. So it's become part of the fabric of the history and sociology of medicine to both historicize and be very skeptical about the apparent inevitability of the psychological disciplines that we inhabit and reproduce. But the suspicion of depth psychology that animates, I think, contemporary medical discourse about FSD as well as the feminist critique of it is also something we would do well to unpick. I think it's important to reflect on how we as historians and also how we as critics of psychiatry, because I think those things tend to be inevitably bound up together, are profoundly shaped by the legacy of these bitter debates about psychiatric ontology and epistemology that surfaced mid to late century. The suspicion of past psychoanalytic psychiatry is something that the feminist critique of FSD in fact has in common with the biological pharmaceutical psychiatry that it opposes. Both the feminist critique and the pharmaceutical discourse need to be seen as part of the rejection of a psychodynamic psychiatry that erupted from a range of locations in scientific and popular culture in the 60s, 70s and 80s. The anxious management of the figure of Freud is the ground, I think, making possible the heroic feminist rhetoric of pharmaceutical companies developing FSD compounds, as well as the offended rhetoric of patient support groups. It's the fault line that runs through the contemporary debate about sexual problems and gives it its acrimonious energy. A problematic effect of the Freud wars is that thinking about the unconscious causes of symptoms becomes a highly fraught area, virtually synonymous with both non-scientific psychiatry of the past and anti-feminist motivations. What becomes difficult to address in this psychiatric era intent on divesting itself of the Freudian past and in a feminist activism that is rightly anxious about the abuses committed in the name of psychotherapy is precisely the kind of scenario where we are opaque to ourselves and where detailed imaginative reading of symptoms, of sensations, of reflexes, where interpretation is what we need, even if interpretation is risky and fraught. This is the bind that symptoms have found themselves in the course of the 20th century. So to conclude, if it's a conclusion, I don't know, um, scholarship on psychiatry must, I think, examine its own sometimes unreflected stake in the history of the relationship between psychiatric theorizing and feminist critique. Feminist critiques of FSD must be careful to reflect on their own past. Attached as they sometimes are to a particular moment in feminist relations to psychiatry, they fail to see both the psychiatric and feminist histories contained within their own position, and they fail to take the history of feminism, including their own, into account. How FSD challenges us, I think, is in the opportunity it presents to help us think about our relationship to things of the past, to the pasts of illnesses, to the pasts of psychiatry, to the various pasts of feminism and to past modes of theorizing about that past. It asks us to reflect not only on the intertwined legacies of psychiatry and feminism and on how these legacies manifest in the stakes that we have as critics of psychiatry, but also to listen to complex discourses about history itself, about what is past and what is present. And I'll just end with a quote that I find very suggestive and fruitful by Roy Schaefer who says that in thinking about the psi disciplines and the impact of Freud, we must give up the idea that there is just one legacy to sum up. Thank you. <laughs>